Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are discussing the Pearson Excel International A-Level Chemistry, Unit 5, for May 2021, Section C. So let's go straight to the question we're looking at today. So question 21 says, I will read, iron is a typical transition metal due to the similar energies of the 3D and 4S electrons. Iron forms compounds in a number of oxidation states. There is iron 2 and iron 3 are the most common oxidation states and iron 3 is the most stable. Iron ions form many complexes including that in hemoglobin uh, which is responsible for oxygen transport in the blood of most vertebrates. The hemoglobin iron complex with oxygen is responsible for the red color of blood. Iron 3 ions may be detected in solution by the addition of Thioglycolic acid, the formula is here, and all the water ligands of the iron 3 iron are replaced, giving a complex with an intense red color, which can be detected in very low concentrations. The complexes in iron two and of iron 2 and iron 3 usually have a coordination number of 6 and are octahedral, but the chloro complexes have a coordination number of 4 and are tetrahedral. Iron and its compounds can act as catalysts. The element catalyzes, element catalyzes the harbor process, acting as a typical heterogeneous catalyst. However, the compounds and complexes of iron are usually homogeneous catalysts. So after reading this, let's go to the first question. They say, explain in terms of electronic configuration or electronic structure, why iron-3 compounds are more stable than iron-2 compounds. So we want to see why iron-3 is more stable than iron-2. We need to begin by writing the electronic configuration. So here I wrote the configuration of iron-2. It is argon and then 3D6. That of iron-3, it's going to be argon 3D5. The reason for this, I skipped the 4S because the 4S are going to be zero since uh, there is going to be some two electrons that are lost here. So looking at the configurations, keeping in mind that the 4S is a zero. Again, I'm reminding you of that. So I saw that for the 3D, look at this one here, the D orbitals, there is no pairing. All the D orbitals have one electron each. While here, we have one D orbital that is going to have a pair, paired electrons. And it means in that paired orbital, there is going to be repulsion, which will not occur in this case. So I say in 3D, uh, 3D5 of iron 3, there is no paired electrons in the D orbitals. However, in the 3D6 of iron 2 electrons, Pairing, electron pairing occurs in one of the D orbitals leading to repulsion. So basically, repulsion leads to lack of stability in one of the orbitals. Therefore, when one electron goes away, that is why a more stable ion 3 plus is going to be formed. So I will go to the next part. Here we have the third ionization energy of ion is 2958 kilojoules per mole. They say write the equation for the third ionization energy of ion includes that symbols. Since they are telling us hard ionization, it means it should already be ion2+. Plus. And since we're talking about ionization, it should be gas. So ion2 plus gas will give us ion3 plus gas, losing the electron. That is third ionization energy of ion3. So the next part says, explain how stable ion3 ions can be formed from ion2 ions in aqueous solution. They want you to refer to the relevant energy changes uh, the, the, uh, of these ions only. So from above, you can see we saw that conversion of ion 2 to ion 3 takes 2958 kilojoules per mole of energy. And this is quite high. It means this is an endothermic process. Breaking away one electron to that is going to be an endothermic process. And since you know that uh, formation of ions, and this is in aqueous solution, it means there are going to be some water ligands. So you break away one of the electrons here, creating ion 3, and then ligands are going to attach. So hydration as water molecules attach onto the ion 3 generates some exothermic energy. If the exothermic energy released when the water, water molecules are attaching onto the ion 3 plus is greater than the required energy or endothermic energy, then this process is going to be easily feasible. So I say to convert ion 2 plus to ion 3, this amount of energy is required and this process is endothermic. However, the hydration energy produced, this is exothermically as water molecules surround the ion 3, 
compensates for the required energy for the endothermic ionization. The reason for this is when water molecules are surrounding the antiplast, they release a lot of energy, and that energy should be greater than the endothermic energy required. Finally, I said, the higher the charge on ion 3, again, this is a higher charge, on ion 3 shows you that ion 3 has a stronger attraction to the water molecules in comparison to ion 3, and meaning the bond or the attraction with the water molecules is going to be stronger, and therefore the release energy is going to be stronger for that. I will continue to the next part. C. Invertebrates use a copper complex, hemotanin, to transport oxygen. So blue oxyhemocyanin gives invertebrate blood its uh, characteristic color. They say explain why oxyhemocyanin and oxyhemoglobin have different colors. So again, here when we talk about origination of color, when you talk about complexes, is due to uh, the transition that can occur. So because these two have different lig different ligands and basically they have different central metal ions, that means as the gap between the d orbitals where electrons are going to transition is going to be different since you remember 3d uh, as the d orbitals are split as ligands approach the central metal so if they have different ligands they're going to have different energy gaps and the electrons are going to require different amounts of energy to transition from lower to higher therefore they will absorb different radiation from different regions of the visible spectrum so this is how you pass this question, talking about the different sets of orbitals or different orbitals uh, that, that are going to be uh, basically the different sets, they, the higher and lower are going to be at different energy levels uh, as they have different ligands or different set metal ions. The different ligands are going to split them into different levels and they will absorb or the electrons will absorb different amount of energy or different radiation as they transition from the lower to the higher during the excitation basically. So I will go to the next part. The next part says the presence, uh, let me, the presence of iron in sodium carbonate can affect its properties. The higher the quality of the sodium carbonate, the lower the properties of iron. So the proportion of iron in the laboratory grade and uh, uh, grade anhydrous sodium carbonate was listed uh, as less than 20 ppm by mass. In an experiment to check this specification, they said 20 grams of the sodium carbonate was dissolved in sulfuric acid and thioglycolic acid added in excess to form the iron 3 thioglycolic acid complex. This is the complex. The solution was made up to 500 centimeters cubed in a volumetric flask and thoroughly mixed. So here they've given us the calorimetric uh, calibration graph, and they've given us the log of transmitters on the y-axis, as well as the concentration in milligrams per decimeter cubed on the x-axis. So they say, the transmittance of the resulting solution was determined using a calorimeter and found to be 39.8%. Remember in the brackets here, it's the log of the percentage of transmittance, so we have transmitted percent. They ask, using the calibration graph, determine whether or not Again, can I remove this? This was my working previously. They say, determine whether or not the iron concentration in this sample of sodium carbonate meets the static specification. So I began by finding the log of this because remember, this is the percentage transmittance. So since the y-axis is log of percentage of transmittance, so log of that, and I got 1.5998. But again, remember here they are using uh, just the maximum is going to be one decimal place. So I rounded off to uh, one decimal place, uh, which is basically just two significant figures. So when I round it off, I came to the graph where I have 1.6 and I drew a vertical line to the, this line they drew. And then I came down here to find the concentration, which appears this thing here is not halfway. It appears to be 0 0.44 milligrams per decimeter cubed. And that is what I have here. Now that I have the concentration, remember, I know they added 500, the, this is going to be, it's in 500 centimeters cubed, and they added 20 grams. So I want to find out the mass of iron in this amount. Remember, this mass, since I have the concentration in milligrams per decimeter cubed, and I have the volume, I can just multiply this and the volume, provided I have converted the volume into decimeters cubed as well. So it's going to be 0 0.44 milligrams per decimeter cubed times volume should be in decimeters cubed. So that's why I divided 500 by 1000. And when I multiply that and that, I get 0 0.22 milligrams. So since milligrams is a unit for mass, that can act as my mass. 
And remember, I have the, the mass of the sample that was weighed. This is 20 grams of sodium carbonate. So I can use the original mass and to find the concentration in ppm. Remember, concentration in ppm is mass of the impurity, the impurity divided by mass of the whole thing times 10 power 6. So I converted milligrams into grams. That is why you see it has times 10 power negative 4. And then here you can see, so that divided by that times 10 power 6 gives me 11 ppm as my answer here. So let's continue to the next part. Suggest what type of ligand thioglycolic acid is in the iron 3 thioglycolic acid complex and justify your answer. So I said it's a bidentate ligand. The reason for this is remember in the introductory statement we read, they say that iron 3 plus has usually has coordination number 6. So I'm referring to that to be able to answer this. I said because there are three ligands in each complex. If you refer back, it's going to be three ligands in its complex, yet the coordination number of ion 3 plus is usually 6. I want to take you back a little bit. Uh, thioglycolic acid, can you see here? Here we can see this is the complex. However, you can see there are three ligands. If I can write here, those are the three ligands. However, we know that ion 3 usually has coordination number 6. So because of that, we can conclude that this is going to be a bidentate ligand. So I will take you back to the previous page. So the next question says, iodine ions are oxidized to iodine by peroxidized sulfate ions. So this is the equation uh, for the reaction. And they say iron, three, iron 2 ions act as a homogeneous catalyst for this reaction. They say state why the catalyst is described as homogeneous. It is homogeneous because everything is iron. They are all in aqueous state. So I say it because the catalyst and the reactants are in the same phase or same state of matter. We can say that this is a homogeneous reaction. Or the catalyst basically is homogeneous. The next part says write two equations to show how iron two ions catalyze this oxidation. The oxidation state symbols are not required. This equation is present in your textbook. We have peroxidized sulfate reacting with iron 2 plus, converting it to sulfate and then iron 3. And then the produced iron 3 is going to react with the other reactant iodide, converting it to iodine, and the catalyst is regenerated. You can see this is regeneration. Actually, there is another equation whereby they use iron 3 as a catalyst as well. Now, since this and that are the reactant, when you use iron 3, iron 3 will react with the iodide, converting it to iodine and then iron 2, and the iron 2 produced will react with the other reactant producing uh, sulfate as well as the iron 3. So in that case as well, the catalyst will be regenerated. Either way, this reaction here, this reaction here, the one I'm marking with red, it can be catalyzed by both iron 2 and iron 3. And you all, the only thing you need to know is when it's iron 2 as the catalyst, it's going to react with the peroxidisulfate first. If it's iron 3, it will go with the iodide first. Okay? And the reason as to why we use a catalyst in this reaction is both reactants are negatively charged. They're going to repel each other. So a catalyst that is positively charged allows them to come into close contact so that a reaction can proceed with less repulsion. So the next part says, suggest how ion to ions lower the activation energy of this reaction. This is in relation to what I've just said. So here we can see ion 2. I said ion 2 is positively charged while both reactants are negatively charged. So they will repel each other. However, using iron 2 plus allows the catalyzed step like that and that. It allows the catalyzed step of the reaction to proceed with lower activation energy. The reason for this is there will be less repulsion. And the reactant and the added catalyst will combine because they are oppositely charged. So the reaction, the st that catalyzed step is going to be really fast and efficient. I will go to the last part. It says... Give a possible reason why the chloro complex of iron ions have a coordination number of four rather than six. Now, chloride ions are really large in comparison to like the, the, the oxygen in the water, the nitrogen in the ammonia. Remember uh, that when a ligand is attaching, it attaches using a specific atom. Now, when you see what a ligand, it attaches with a, 
with a hydrogen and then ammonia ligand attaches with its uh, of course the lone pair but it's going to be on the nitrogen so because these are smaller nitrogen is small oxygen is small however chloride is really big in comparison to the others so you cannot fit six chloride ligands around or six chloride atoms around the central metal they are too huge and the steric hindrance is going to be great so i say because chloride ions are larger they will experience greater steric hindrance to enable the six ligands to fit around the central metal. Steric hindrance is when kind of like blocking or there is not enough space for everything to fit. So they are kind of squeezing and blocking each other. That is what we can call steric hindrance. So this brings us to the end uh, of this question, which is basically the end of section C. Thank you for being with us. Please remember to subscribe. I will post a link to the previous section A as well as section B videos in this description box in the description box for this video. See you again in our next video. Bye bye.